morning, everybody. Let's stand and worship together today. So come, let's worship. Thanks for being here with us. Welcome to Northeast. My name is Corbin, and uh, I'm really uh, I'm excited to be here with all of you. I actually uh, went to bed last Sunday after our last Easter service, and I just woke up. So um, <laughs> it's really good to see people and humans again. I'm glad you're here. Glad uh, you all are joining us online. It's so good to be with our church family together again. Uh, we are going to uh, we're going to have an acoustic weekend this week. If you uh, if you've been around for a little while, you, you may have gotten used to this by now, but once a month, we like to kind of strip away the bigness of our, our worship services uh, because we don't need it to worship. Uh, we don't need the lights and the drums and all the, the big sound. We, we like it because uh, we have some really gifted people who 
that is their, their offering they're able to bring to God, but we don't need it to worship. So uh, this is a, a great time for us to be reminded uh, that worship is about us uh, bringing something to God and giving it to him. And we don't need, we don't need a p- particular kind of environment to do that. So I encourage you to, uh, to sing along with us, to lift up your voices, and let's celebrate our amazing God together. Uh, before we do anything else, let's pray. Father, we, we praise you for who you are. We thank you that we can gather in your name. Uh, we thank you for this, uh, this time of the year, this, uh, this week we're just coming from where we are, uh, we're reminded of what your son did for us. Uh, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the resurrection of your son, Jesus. And we thank you that through his resurrection, we have hope and new life and freedom and uh, we thank you that no matter how many times we have gone astray and we have run and turned from you, you continue to chase after us because you love us intimately and you want to know us and you want to be with us and you want us to know you. So God, we listen to your voice today. We listen for your spirit, for your prompting. We seek after you with all that we have. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, uh, we're going we're gonna to learn a new song because it's, uh, it's fun to do that on these acoustic weekends too. And I don't know if you're, if you're like me, but um, it's really easy uh, to feel overwhelmed uh, with life and with um, whatever, whatever it is with uh, you get into a busy season at work, you get into crazy season at home and uh, it feels like there's always something that just feels like you are overwhelmed and you're fighting this crazy uphill battle. And uh, I don't know if, if you're like me, but it's, it's easy to forget that I'm never alone in those battles and I'm never alone in those struggles uh, and that God has always walked alongside of us through our fights. Uh, every time we face something that seems insurmountable, that seems uh, terrifying, he's always been right there alongside of us and he's never left us alone. So uh, that's what this song is about. And I, I pray that as we, as we sing, this has been a favorite one of mine. This has been one that I've come back to over and over again the last year or so, uh, just to remind me that God has always been there. He's always there, and he's presently here with you no matter where you are in your life. So um, as you feel comfortable, as this starts to feel familiar, I encourage you to join in with us as we sing.
God, we, we believe that today. We know that we will strive with all that we have to build our lives on your foundation. And when we try to build on the sand, God, we thank you that you come and you pick us up and you pull us out of the wreckage. You let us start again and again. God, we thank you that your love is a foundation that we can build on. We thank you that it's so perfect. God, we desire to know you more today and we desire to experience your love more today. So my prayer for every person in this room, including myself, is that we open ourselves to you to be filled with your spirit, to be filled with your love. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray and we worship. Amen. You can take a seat. Great truth in those words. At this point, I want to invite our servers to come forward and start passing the communion trays. And as a tray comes by, grab a piece of the bread and one of the cups and hold on to that. We'll take communion together as a family in just a moment. You know, I got the opportunity to grow up right down the street. And when I say that, I mean like literally right down the street, like left on 1694. We go back between Norton Commons, Glen Oaks. There's a little Catholic school back there. That's Schuler Lane. That's where I grew up. And it was the greatest place in the world to grow up because we had fields and waterfalls and motorbikes. And we had our crew. There was Billy and Ronnie and Willie and my brother and I. And we were always up to something. Not always up to good, but we were up to something. And most of the time it was in our front yard and it had something to do with a ball. Whether it was kickball, wiffle ball, football, kill the man with the ball. You know, good all-American boy activities. Uh, but there was... It never failed. Whenever we were playing kickball or something like that, there was this power line that went across the front of our yard. And sometime during every game, somebody would kick that ball and it would go up and hit the power line and everybody would yell what? Do over, right? Do over. Everybody's yard had a do over rule. It's where you just rewind, command Z, undo. You get to go back and try it all over again. I never could have realized how many times I would have needed do-overs in my life. As I grew up, they don't come as easy as they did in my front yard, that's for sure. We'd make a snap decision, and it would change the trajectory of our lives, and we just wish we could go back and yell, do-over, do-over. Those words that you just can't take back, that trust that you break, that loved one that you let down, they're not so ready to just let you have a do-over. You know, last weekend we celebrated Easter. We celebrated how our Savior died on a cross, was buried in a tomb, and then on the third day was resurrected. He conquered death. And through this, he made a way where we could be, be clean, come back to God, be forgiven of our sin and our shame. To put it real simple, he made a way where we could have a do-over. And that changes us. It changes everything about us. I love what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says. That means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Who needs that do-over today? You know, you are surrounded by a bunch of people who at one point or another in their lives threw their hands up and said, I'm, I'm messed up. I cannot fix this on my own. I need a do-over. And we have a gracious heavenly father who is so ready to offer that. He did everything he could to make it possible. He gave his one and only son so that we could come back to him and be made new to be made clean. 
That's what we celebrate when we take communion. Maybe. As we have the bread, which represents his body that's been broken for us, and the cup that reminds us of his blood that's been poured out for our sin. And basically when we take this, we're just shouting out to God, do over. You are the one who does for me what I can't do for myself. You make me clean, you make me new. Let's celebrate that together as we take the bread. And we take the cup. You pray with me. Dear God, we thank you so much that you made a way where we could be made new and we don't deserve it. We don't deserve it, but you give it so graciously. Thank you, Lord, that we can be made new. We can be forgiven. I pray that we live in that joy and hope this week. And remember, you give us a do-over. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. At this point, I want to invite the servers to come forward and start collecting the offering. And just want to remind you that you can also give on the app or online at nechurch.org slash give. And that way you can practice generosity even when you're not in the room with us. And it's only because of that generosity that we're able to accomplish our mission of boldly changing lives now. One of the ways we see that happen all the time is through our partner schools. Right now we have nine partner schools where we just go to them and we say, how can we help? And then we help. One of the ways early on they needed assistance was they noticed when kids go off during the summer, they don't read as much. And so when they come back in the fall, it takes a long time catching them back up to where they were when they left. And so that's when we started our summer reading program. And it is awesome because we take our summer reading party to different locations consistently through the summer. And we just give the kids popsicles, a book they can take home and read themselves and have forever. And we'd love all over them. And it's a beautiful, amazing thing. And the question is, has it made a difference? I got the opportunity to talk to Sarah, who's a stakeholder here at Northeast and has volunteered for the program. And she also is a teacher at our partner school. And she's got to see some of the kids who participated in this. And she said, when they come to school, they are ready to do school. She remembered the second grade girl that she said would come every week so excited, so honored, like it was the best part of her summer. And she would show up and she'd get that book and she'd talk to those volunteers and she'd feel so cherished and loved and she'd read that book all through the week and come back ready for the next one. That's the kind of difference we want to make again this year is we'll be at five different locations for six straight weeks. We hope to serve about 150 students at these. And also our Northeast kids are stepping in. They're doing a book drive right now to start collecting those books that we're gonna be giving away. It is so cool to be a part of a church where servanthood is cherished. If that's a way you think you might wanna serve as a stakeholder here, oh, I wanna encourage you, stop by the Northeast kids, find out what you can do or just step up and go on to the nechurch.org slash schools online and you can find out all kinds of ways to plug in there. Thank you so much for your generosity. It's only because of that that we get to change lives, even one kid at a time. You know, I'm so excited today as we get to celebrate a baptism and this is Gracie. The cool thing is I did her baby dedication back when she was a baby. I shot the video of it. And we're so excited we get to celebrate that right now. This is um, my daughter, Gracie. Gracie, girl, we cannot even begin um, to describe how proud of uh, you we are. Um, your whole tribe right here and mommy and daddy, um, we're just so proud of the amazing young lady that you're growing into. And um, I know this baptism has been a while in the making. Um, you've had a few medical hiccups that have slowed the process down, but through it all, you've sh told, taught daddy and I how to have um, a childlike faith um, with all the poking and prodding and medical tests you've had done. You've um, just showed us how to have faith in God and say that it's going to be okay and that he's got it. Um, you come out with a smile no matter how much you're hurting and just taught us once again um, to put our faith in Jesus Christ. And I just thank you for teaching Daddy how that. Um, we cannot wait to walk on streets of gold with you one day, girl, in heaven. And um, I'm just so incredibly blessed to be your mama. Um, Gracie, I have one question for you. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, 
And have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? I do. You are now being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is awesome. That is awesome. We get to be a part of those celebrations as a body. That's great. Well, we are glad you're here today. If you were here last week, you found out that we are starting a brand new series on the evolution of parenting, and we're also having a Best Parents Ever competition, of which just being here, you've already taken the first step. For a little more information, check this out. Jason, you know how you're always saying it's very important to be a good parent? I was just saying that. It's very important to me to be a good parent. Well, then you don't want to miss our next series on the evolution of parenting. Wow, like how I can raise my kids in a different world than I grew up in? Absolutely. There'll be a parenting event, there'll be a marriage event, and more. Oh, plus I have a feeling there's some kind of special incentive if I come to these services and events. Your intuition is uncanny, my friend. Every service or event that you check in at, you get an entry into the Best Parents Ever competition. The Best Parents Ever competition? You know what it seems like we should do for the Best Parents Ever? Send them to Disney World. I know it sounds like an astonishing series of coincidences, but yes, a very special family will go on a very special vacation. Wow, for real, that's spectacular. So all you have to do is come to a weekend service or a midweek opportunity, and every time you do, you'll get an entry into the contest. Well, that sounds fantastic. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna come to every weekend service and every midweek opportunity for entries into the contest. That sounds like a perfect plan. Best parents ever! Yeah! Yes, that's right. So today we start our uh, new sermon series called The Evolution of Parenting. And our hope is that uh, each week you will show up. You have a very special family in your mind, uh, maybe a family in need, uh, maybe a family who's going through a really, really hard time right now. And you out there at the entry buckets will take their name, write their name down, throw it in. And at the end of this uh, parenting series, we'll get to bless some uh, special family in our community with a moment, with a memory that could synergize those relationships and revive their family in a really, really cool way. So make sure you participate in that. On top of that, we've We've got all sorts of parenting stuff popping off throughout the next five weeks in this series to help, uh, to help just raise the lid on your parenting. Uh, one, we have a, a parenting event coming up. Uh, it's, I think it starts not this week, but the week after. It'll be three weeks long, and they're going to be walking through a book together uh, in kind of a class, small group uh, sort of environment. Uh, and it's, the book is actually one of the books that I use to, to research a lot of my material for this series. It's a great book. Uh, you're going to want to jump in that. It'll raise the lid. Uh, we have a marriage event throughout this series because one of the best things you can do for your kids is to make sure that you're working on your marriage. So jump in that. And uh, we actually have a five-week parenting challenge located on our app. If you pull out our app underneath the, the uh, evolution of parenting tile, if you click on it, it says uh, best parent ever challenge. You click on the parenting challenge, there's like a checklist of about 20 different things that we're calling our parents to do over the next month. Some of them are small, like feed your kid vegetables. Some of them are big. Okay, so here's what I'm challenging you. Men in the room, I'm challenging you to get on the app, print off the checklist, and you lead the charge on this. And I'm telling you, your wife's gonna look at you and she's gonna be like, who have you become? We're going to church every week. So men, take charge on this, all right? At the end of the day, though, we hope at the end of this five weeks, everybody's raised the lid on their parenting. Whether you got young kids, whether you got old kids, uh, whether you got 10 kids, where they got one kid, we want you to become a better parent. All right, uh, one more quick announcement before we get down to today. Next week's Derby weekend, and we will not be having Saturday night service, as is the typical routine. So if you're a typical Saturday person, don't come. We will not be here. Use Saturday as an opportunity to enjoy one of the cool things about our city and connect with your people. Go love the Ville. Uh, all right. Now today to launch our series, I want to start with, uh, I want to start with two facts of parenting. In this day and age, and when you hear them, you might—I don't—you might disagree with me at first. But over the course of this message, I hope you'll you'll come around. Uh, here's fact number one: fact. Uh, you are raising your kids in a world that you weren't, and that's just a fact. So, fact number two: you cannot raise your kids the same way that you were, and that's just a fact. You see, okay, there's a generational gap between the world that you grew up in and the world that your kids are growing up in. And if we do not mind the gap as parents, mind that generational gap, seek to understand it and seek to bridge the gap, then we will never connect with our kids in the way that we would hope to connect with our kids. You see, now here's what I find. I find that a lot of people, rather than seeking to understand the generational gap, ignore it 
or completely and totally underestimate it. So let me give you just an exaggerated comparison here so that you can start like wrapping your mind around the fact that we are so far removed from our kids and our grandkids. Um, me and my grandmother, we are uh, two completely different people for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, and I love her, but, but we're just raised in different worlds. Same country, same state, but completely and totally different worlds. You see, I'm a millennial. I'm an 80s, 90s baby. That's when I was raised, 86, raised through the 90s. Um, you know, I'm sorry for the boomers in the room. I just said the M word in church, millennials. It's a cuss word in your home. I get it. But, but, uh, but my, my grandma, on the flip side, she's what they call a, a builder, which means she was raised in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Now, question for you. Do you think the 20s, 30s, and 40s were a little bit different than the 80s and 90s? You see, uh, let's just think for a second. What, were, what was going on in our country when she was raised? Well, I don't know, lots of things like a world war, a great depression. This is why my grandma is just so simple. She's just a simple person. Uh, for years now, uh, her adult kids have been trying to get her to get an iPad or an iPhone. But she's like, I don't want the iPad, the Google. You know, this, is a, this is her mindset. Uh, and they're like, listen, it can help you communicate better with us. You know, you can shop from the comforts of her home. But she's like, no, no, no. As long as I got a roof over my head and food on the table and clothes on my back, then life's pretty good. This is why she's so frugal as well. Uh, she will not let us brew a new pot of coffee at her house until the old one's gone. Doesn't matter if it's 24 hours old, 48 hours old, put it in the microwave. <laughs> Tastes the same. Which is blasphemy, by the way, for us millennials. Because we are coffee snobs. All right, did you know that 98% of millennials will serve as a barista before the age of 30? All right, that's not a real statistic, but it sounds real. Some of you are like, that's probably true. It's either a barista or a photographer or a barista photographer. But, but you, okay, you get my point, right? You following me? The generational gap between her and I is huge. And I love her, but it's huge. We're two generations removed too. And you and your kids are only one generation removed, but the generational gap is huge. And we would be wise not to underestimate it, but instead try to understand it and bridge it. I'll give you a few examples of uh, the generational gap between you and your kids. Uh, your kids are growing up right smack dab in the middle of what we would call the digital revolution. Have you noticed? Screens internet, social media platforms, every aspect of their life is saturated with this. If your kid's under the age of 30, then they're what social scientists call a digital native because they've grown up only knowing the internet age. Now, while that has uh, had some really cool side effects on our society, it's also had some unintended consequences in the way that our kids see themselves in the world. Uh, first, it's changed how our kids interact with others. The vast majority of personal interactions today are not face-to-face -face anymore, rather they're face to screen. You got FaceTime, you got email, text, Insta stories, you know, DMs, PMs, all the Ms, right? It's just, it's face to screen. In light of that, we've seen a spike in loneliness among young people. Because while they're the most connected generation ever, they're the loneliest generation ever because they have a thousand relationships but that are only an inch deep. We've also seen uh, young people lose the ability to have civil debate, dialogue, and conflict with others. And the reason why is because the conflict they see modeled for them is the conflict they see on social media. And have you ever been on social media before? Lord, help our kids as what they see us say and do. Now, you know what I think it is? I think it's a lot easier uh, when you're typing at a screen to forget that there's a person behind the screen. It's easier to dehumanize a screen than it is a person, but at the end of the day, there's a person behind it. Uh, it's also changed the way how our kids see themselves. It's the age of the selfie. Okay, the age of the social media where, where you've got to give 24-7 real-time updates of what's going on, uh, on in my life. In fact, it's interesting. It almost feels like it doesn't really happen until you've posted on social media. Now, uh, older folks in the room, you look at this kind of social media phenomenon and you think to yourself, man, that's just it's nuts. Why are our kids so narcissistic and self-absorbed? And I get why you say that, but actually psychologists have proven that it's not narcissism at all. In fact, uh, social media is not creating self-absorption. It's creating a desperately insecure generation. Because you know what they see? They spend their days scrolling through social media and they see their friends sanitized, filtered, living my best life version of their lives. And then they compare their reel to their friend's highlight reel. And it can just be crushing on a kid. I've grown up in this age. It's also changed how much of the world 
our kids see. At the click of a button, they are exposed to explicit pornographic content, violent gaming, coarse language, political corruption, the world's greatest tragedies at the click of a button. And again, while we're on it, at the click of a button, our kids can access all sorts of different information. Have you noticed that? They are just a Google search or a YouTube video away from figuring out anything they really want to. Your kids don't need you anymore to get information. You know that, right? In fact, they'll learn more from a handheld device than they will in a classroom. One parenting author uh, said that the challenge for parents today in this day and age isn't communicating new information to their kids. It's showing them how to find true information because the information is out there. It's just a matter of sifting through it all. Now, this right here is the generational gap. And that's just one factor. That is just a small fraction of what stands between the world you were raised in and the world you were ki your kids were raised in. I'll give you a few more examples. Uh, there's the emergence of achievement culture. We live in an increasingly individualistic culture. So our kids feel this pressure to achieve as individuals. Oh, you wanna play a sport? Great, but you can't just play a sport. You gotta play on a travel team. And you can't just play on a travel team. You gotta play on that travel team. And if you play on that travel team, you're gonna have to miss church on weekends. We're gonna have to pull you out of school sometime on Fridays. Oh, and speaking of school, uh, you need to be in the top 10% of your class so you can get a scholarship to that college. And speaking of college, you're gonna have to be there for six years, get two degrees, a truckload of student debt so you can compete for that top job. And by top job, I mean a job that makes you successful, famous, and rich because that's what our culture applauds. Talk about pressure. There's this leadership maxim out there uh, that says what's rewarded is repeated. What's rewarded is repeated. And you see what's repeated by our young people today. And I wonder why. The New York Times recently uh, published an article that said two of the generational lies that our kids are believing uh, is one, career success is fulfilling. And two, happiness comes from individual achievement. And you don't have to live long to know that. Both of those are just lies. Uh, third, uh, interesting generational gap. We've seen uh, statistically that there's been a rise in individual risk factors over communal risk factors. Uh, when I was a kid and probably when you were a kid, the stuff that you got in trouble with was, uh, well, was stuff that you're doing with your friends, like partying, drinking, you know, drug use, premarital sex. All these were communal risk factors that were more prominent, but actually we can celebrate this. Those are actually on decline with teenagers today. But you know what's on the rise? Individual risk factors like depression, anxiety, suicide. Did you know that California recently legislated that uh, every middle school and high school student has to have the national suicide hotline on the back of their student IDs because they've noticed the prevalence of this. Here's a fourth example, the exposure to diversity. Your kids are living in a more diverse world. I actually kind of like that. I like that. Being surrounded with diversity gives you different perspective on life. But when I say diversity, I don't mean they're just surrounded with racial and ethnic diversity. I also mean they're surrounded with thought diversity. At one time, Christianity was kind of the American way, but now it's just another way in America. And if you want to parent your kid to be a Jesus follower in this country, then you're going to have to parent them differently than you were parented. Maybe that's the reason why a lot of kids are walking away from the church because we're raising them to be Christians today in the same way we were 30 years ago. And the world's not the same as it was 30 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the generational gap. And I could go on, I could show you 50 other points, but I think you get the point. We better not underestimate this. Okay, in Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse nine, there's this interesting life maxim. Uh, it says, there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. You heard that before? It's biblical. You should read your Bible. It's just good stuff in there. There's nothing new under the sun. Um, and while I agree with that, I think it's oftentimes misapplied. Because uh, while the human condition never changes, there's nothing new there, the conditions in which humans live are constantly changing. And we have to mind that. Let me say it to you like this, and maybe this will land it for you. Uh, I believe that the truth never changes. It doesn't, but it's proper and appropriate application is constantly changing depending on the culture, depending on the kid, depending on the situation, depending on the stage in life that your kid finds themselves in. And that's what the wise parent recognizes. They recognize that 
the virtues and values that are true, that, that are godly and apparent, they're as old as God. The virtues and values that we want to instill in our kids, they're as old as God. They're the truth, right? But the way that we instill them and the culture in which we are instilling them in, well, that's changing. And so we better change our application with the times. Now, uh, let me go a little bit deeper on these two words, truth and application. I wanna, I wanna define them for you because I think that one's really, really simple for the Jesus follower and the other's super complicated. Okay, for the Jesus follower, J Jesus actually makes truth simple for us. Now, application is complicated, okay, because your kids are complicated, you're complicated. This world is complicated, but thank God that Jesus simplifies the truth for us. Uh, in the New Testament, after there being like 600 plus some odd commandments, Jesus shows up on the scene, he says, I'm gonna boil it down to one. I'm gonna give you one commandment to targets. Uh, you can find that passage in Matthew 22. It's one of our foundational verses as a church. I read it probably once a month here because I want us to found our lives on it and I want everybody to memorize it in the room. Scripture uh, memory has, uh, memorization has kind of gone out of, out of style in this day and age. Um, but if you desire to memorize scripture, you should memorize this one. Uh, Matthew 22, verse 37. Uh, once by a lawyer, Jesus was asked, teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? And this is what Jesus said to him. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. Uh, this is the greatest and first commandment. And then there's a second one that's just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. Or in other words, Jesus basically says one command, two targets. It's all love, right? Love God and love your neighbor. Now, in our culture today, though, love has kind of become an arbitrary word. I love pizza and I love my children. Okay, well, which one do you love more? You get what I'm saying, right? Um, so, so Jesus actually, he defines love for us very clearly. In fact, in John 13, it's one of my favorite passages. This is what he says to his disciples. Um, he says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. And here's what makes it new. I want you to love one another just as I have loved you. That's how. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. So in Jesus' mind, love is not chemistry. Love is not necessarily romance. Love isn't a fuzzy feeling. Love isn't even always kindness. Now in Jesus' mind, love has a very specific shape. See, Jesus said this to his disciples literally minutes before he was arrested and drugged to a cross. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another, he says. So you see the shape of Jesus' love? It's cross-shaped. It's cross-shaped. And you know what cross-shaped love is? It's what Jesus did for us. And it's what we should do for our kids. Cross-shaped love is doing what's best for them, no matter what it takes for me. And honestly, that's simple. This is the truth of Jesus. This is what the true follower of Jesus looks like. They look like cross-shaped love. And you probably knew that. You're not even a Christian. And you probably walked in here and knew that's what Jesus is all about. Now, you know what makes this whole conversation complicated? It's not the truth, it's the application of this truth. Because when we move from truth to application, we move from the question, what is love? To what does love look like? And I'm gonna tell you what, if you, if you, got, two, if you got two kids, then you know that loving those kids, it's just it's an entirely different ball game as to how you have to coach each, each up. So one of the most, uh, helpful things I've ever heard on parenting to this regard um, was, uh, was uh, what they called the stages of parenting. You ever heard this before, the stages of parenting? Uh, I've been at Northeast now for almost seven years. I've heard three different preachers stand on stage and lay out the stages of parenting before. Three different ones. So I might as well throw my hat in and become the fourth. Uh, but uh, I don't know where the original source is. I think it was some book written 20, you know, 10, 20 years ago, but, this, but it's so good, okay? And it helps us understand the importance of applying love at different stages of our kid's life. Uh, first, there's, uh, there's the discipline years from about one to five years old. At this stage in your kid's life, you're just actually teaching them that there's consequences for actions. That's it. When you do something, it could have a positive consequence. It can have a negative consequence in your life. You're, you're connecting the two. Then it's about to hit four to five years old, all the way up to their teen years. You move into the training years. This is when you start explaining the why behind the what. You start explaining, well, this is why this consequence is for this action. This is why if you do this, 
you honor God, and if you do this, you don't. This is why if you do this, uh, you'll live a life that's, that's you know, happy and fulfilling, and if you don't, you'll live a life that's not. You, sh- you, start, you start connecting those dots for them and help them build their worldview. Then once they hit about 12, 13 years old, they move into the coaching years, and this is where a lot of people struggle. Because see, you know what coaches do? They move to the sidelines. They get out of the game. Here's what coaches do. Coaches encourage from the sidelines. Coaches sometimes call a timeout and huddle the team. Coaches sometimes offer some constructive, angry criticism to get their players' attention. Sometimes coaches bench a player because that player deserves to be benched. But here's what coaches don't do. They don't play the game. They don't. If their players are gonna lose, they let their players lose and learn from that. They do everything they can prepare, uh, they can to prepare them for that. They do everything they can to coach them through that moments. But sometimes your players win and sometimes they lose. And a coach understands that. Some of us need to understand that. Then once you get to about anywhere 18 to 22, you move to the last phase of parenting. It's called the friendship years, the friendship years. And this is kind of the pie in the sky goal for all of us. We would love to enjoy life with our adult kids. I get that. But if you don't prepare the way with these first few stages, then it'll make the last stage increasingly difficult for you. Now, uh, again, what's my point in laying this out? My point is this. Don't you see? The goal's always the same, no matter the stage you're in. The truth doesn't change, but its application is constantly changing as your kid gets older and older, more and more mature and more and more independent. Now, you know what this right here points to? This points to a second biblical virtue that I think is absolutely vital for parenting and any relationships. There's love, but then there's also the second virtue that I believe is as important as love, wisdom, wisdom. And you see, while love is the truth virtue, wisdom, wisdom is the application virtue. Love is doing what's best, whatever it takes, but wisdom is discerning how and when to do that so that it takes, so that it lands with your kid, depending on your kid, depending on their age, depending on what life's going to. And I've just found that the very best parents live at the overlap of these two. The overlap of love and wisdom, the overlap of of truth and timing, truth and tone, truth and temperament. So if that's not applicable enough for you, uh, let me boil it down uh, even more. You know what I found just observing great parents who Lindsay and I want to mom and dad like? I found that they just intuitively move through two questions anytime they make a big parenting decision together. These are two questions. One, what's the loving thing to do? Uh, to do? And two, what's the wise way to do it? They just intuit this. It just comes naturally to them. One, what's the loving thing to do? Because that gets at what's best for my kid and what's best is important. Okay, love isn't always nice. Love isn't always kind. Sometimes love is tough love, right? Sometimes that's what's best for your kid. But one, what's the loving thing to do? And two, what's the wise way to make sure that this lands with them, that they'll receive this, that this will actually be impactful, perhaps even inspirational to them. Okay, so there's this interesting passage uh, in Ephesians uh, chapter, chapter 6, verse 4. Uh, it's one of the few passages in the New Testament on parenting. There's actually not much in there about parenting. But in this one, Paul lays out the, the tension of this for us. Uh, he says, uh, do not exasperate your children, but raise them in the training of the Lord. Now, do you see the, the tension here? And the second part, he says, raise them in the Lord's truth, Right? Raise them in the Lord Jesus' truth, which is what? Cross-shaped love. The apostle Paul knew that. We know that. But he calls us to be cross-shaped parents and to raise cross-shaped kids. But there's one caveat to this. And that's the first part of this verse. He says, you have to do it without exasperating your kids. And I love that word, exasperate. You should go home and let your kid give you an exasperation score today. Okay, on a scale of one to 100, how much do I, because for some of you, this is your barrier to entry with your kid right now. You are the CEO, the chief exasperating officer at your house. (laughs) Like you meet snarkiness with more snarkiness. You meet anger with more anger, volume with more volume. You always got to power up. You always got to get the last word. You always come down really, really hard. And you know what? That may work sometimes. That may even be appropriate. 
sometimes, but if you do that every time, over time it begins to rub your kid and eventually they become callous to your parenting. You exasperate them. And really you're kind of a hypocrite because how can you stand before them and say, you need to love like Jesus in a completely and totally unloving way? Okay, so we say it around here uh, like this a lot. And um, you probably, if you've been around here long, you've heard me say this before, uh, but I've never applied it to parenting, but I think it's more applicable to parenting than anything else. Okay, we say it like this. Uh, the follower of Jesus, particularly the, the, the Christian parent who wants to follow Jesus, learns how to balance truth and love. Truth and love, or truth in love, right? Because you see, love without truth isn't love at all. It's enablement. And some of us are enablers when it comes to our kids. I hear a lot of folks who have young kids say, well, you know, I just wanna be my kid's best friend. I just, want, I just wanna help them become, you know, whoever they wanna be. Now, it's, listen, they're 13 years old, guys. They're in, the, they're in the seventh grade. One, they don't know who they wanna be. They need your help. And two, they don't wanna be your best friend. They're in the seventh grade. You'll probably find that out pretty soon. Now, on the flip side, while love without truth is enablement, truth without love, all ye chief exasperators in the room, will never be heard because you're a jerk, because you're a butthead. It's like as soon as you step up and go in, whoop, 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 the butthead bell goes off in your kid's head and they turn you off because here he goes again. You ever had your kid come home and say, uh, you know, wow, my coach said something to me da- today, uh, you know, mom, and it was so inspirational. And as they start explaining it to you, uh, you think to yourself, I've been telling you that for four years. <laughs> I wonder why, I wonder why they didn't listen. Maybe, maybe, maybe you need to step back and reevaluate. Because you know what I found? I found that the very best parents don't lean in one direction or the other. Rather, they try to find a balance between the two, the overlap of love and wisdom. They consider these two questions. What's the loving thing to do and what's the wise way to do it? Love and wisdom. Now, um, here's the interesting thing that the scriptures say about love and wisdom. Uh, These are two virtues that you can actually grow over time. You can get better at them. You can also get worse, but you can get better at them. They're not natural, they're not automatic, they're not inherent, they're vital to your relationships, but they don't just come easy, right? You actually have to work at them in order to get better at them. So uh, for our last few minutes here, I wanna get even more practical and I wanna give you three ideas, okay? Three pieces of homework. And I'm gonna tell you, if you go home and you begin to practice these three things in your parenting life, then you will actually get better at discerning what love looks like and also better at being wise. Here's the first one. Uh, one, uh, I want to challenge you to spend quality time. Spend quality time with your kids. And I know that sounds generic and simple, but it is absolutely, positively vital. When you spend quality time uh, with your kids, one, you build trust with your kids. Because you show your kids, I don't just love you, I actually like you as well. You build the relationship. And the stronger the relationship is, the better those hard moments are gonna go. Like in those moments where you have to step up and say something tough, in those moments where you have to discipline, in those moments where you're gonna dole out consequences or there's gonna be conflict and confrontation, even though they may look at you and, you know, mm, 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 even though they may look at you and stomp away, even though they may say, I hate you, mom, I hate you, dad, and slam the door, deep down inside, at the end of the day, they'll know that it's all love. It's all love because you've been proving it to them one day at a time, day after day, by investing the quality time, the quality time. Now, not only does quality time build trust, but it also builds familiarity with your kids. You just actually learn more about your kids the more you hang out with them, like any that, anybody or anything. You learn their love languages, you learn their triggers, you learn what's going on with their lives. And when you know more about what's going on in their lives, it's easier to land the truth that you need to speak as a parent. Okay, so, uh, so here's, here's some really practical homework for you on this one this week. I challenge you to go home and study your kids this week. Study them, research. Do some research on your kids this week. I want you to open your ears and I want you to listen. And anytime they say, um, they say a musician that they like or uh, you know, a food that they like, a video game that they like, a sports team that they like, a place that they like, anytime they say something that they like, I want you to write it down and then I want you to go do that with them. I want you to develop a shared interest with them. 
because there's maybe no better way to spend quality time. The reason why you and your kid don't spend much quality time right now is you don't have any shared interests, right? But you're the mom, you're the dad, you're the adult. So you gotta step into their world. So look, if they like video games, maybe you just need to learn how to play some video games. You might be surprised how much quality time you spend together if you both start playing the same video game. Okay, so you know what I love about our city? Um, we got the, so the Yum Center is down the street. Um, and, um, and all the time, like there's these musicians and bands that come into town. And every year there's like, you know, boy bands, like teeny bopper groups come in. And, uh, and I always think it's so funny that on those nights, uh, all these dads of middle school girls take their daughters to like the Bieber concert or the, you know, the, the Taylor Swift concert, the, the Jonas Brothers concert. And when you look on Facebook, there's like pictures because the mom's got to get a picture of this. Um, uh, and like the, the, the middle school daughter's like all decked out, big sign, T-Swift shirt on, glitter on her face, like, ah, you know. And the dad's sitting there next to him like, ah. Okay, and, and I've seen some of y'all's pictures. Okay? And the reason why that, uh, that they're like that is because the last place dad wants to be on a Friday night is at, you know, the Jonas Brothers concert. But the first place he wants to be is with his middle school daughter. And that's just an example of a dad stepping in, creating a shared interest so he can spend the quality time. It's interesting, my son and Palmer and I developed this habit recently. Uh, we were uh, getting up really early in the morning uh, together. First one's up in the house and we would go downstairs, I'd pour him some chocolate milk, we'd talk, we'd watch a show, I'd make him breakfast, whatever, right? Uh, well, um, I didn't really think much of it until one day uh, his little sister Larkin uh, who's one, he's four, she's one, woke up before him. And so I had Larkin downstairs and I was doing some stuff and Palmer woke up, he came walking downstairs and when he walked into the living room, uh, he looked at me and his lip got really big and tears welled up in his eyes and started to come down. And I said, Palmer, buddy, what's, what's wrong? And this is what he said, he said, Larkin Rose is crashing our boy time. And I had the same reaction. I had the same reaction. But see, here's the deal. I never called it boy time. I never put that idea in his head. That was his idea. That's what he saw that as. And so you know what I started scheduling into my calendar every single day? Boy time. Boy time. He, he actually FaceTimed me this morning on his mom's phone. Sad because I had to get out early and come to church and get ready because we missed boy time today. I was like, buddy, I got you tonight. Even if we just go play catch in the yard, even if we just drive to the grocery store together, he and I just spend a little father-son time alone. I know it's important to him, and I love that. I want to hold on to that as long as I can. All right, so here's the second uh, really piece of uh, practical advice that will help you grow in love and wisdom. Uh, it says, empathize, don't minimize. Empathize, don't minimize. Empathize with your kids, don't minimize their problems. We are so good as parents at minimizing our kids' problems because we feel the weight of the world on our shoulders. And when we look at their problems, we understand, it, you know, it's, in the grand scheme of things, it's probably not that big of a deal. In fact, that's the kind of stuff we say. Uh, we say things like, hey, buddy, you know, you'll look back at this and laugh. You know, sweetie, it's not that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. You know, honey, try to keep things in perspective of life. Now, while you're probably right, mom, while you're probably right, dad, um, when you say that to your kids, what you're discounting is the fact that they're 12 years old. This is the biggest thing in life to them getting cut from the ball team, bullied by you know, an enemy, betrayed by a friend, dumped by that girl. That's, that's the most emotional thing that they've experienced in their 13 years on this earth. And so if over time you keep saying things like, oh, keep this in perspective. Listen, you'll look back at this and laugh. What they'll start to hear you say is, I don't really understand how you feel. And then they'll just stop bringing to you their situations and how they feel. I know you don't want that. So empathize. Empathize instead of, instead, inst, ex, okay, over-empathize instead of minimize. Try your very best to put yourself in those third grade shoes and that, you know, 14-year-old shoes and that freshman in college's shoes. And what you'll find is that the truth won't change, but your understanding of the way to communicate that truth and love your kid will. Here's the last piece of application. Uh, focus on the big picture. Focus on, this will make you better at discerning what love looks like and wiser as a parent. Focus on the big picture. Now, you guys know what the big picture of parenting is, right? Okay, here's what it is. You can't keep them forever. Eventually, you don't want to keep them forever. But at first, you're like, oh, I want to keep them forever. You can't. You can't keep them forever. Uh, one day, they will have to stand before the world and be weighed and measured on their own. And one day, they'll have to stand before God. 
and be weighed and measured on their own. That's the big picture. The big picture is that you get them for about 20 years and then you launch them. Hopefully as a responsible citizen. Hopefully as a person of character and integrity. Hopefully as a young man or a young woman who has actionable skills where they can provide for themselves and for their family. And hopefully as someone who has a personal relationship with Jesus. That's the big picture. So maybe I can say it like this. Um, moms, dads. Uh, if, uh, if you are currently reliving your athletic glory days through your child, you have lost sight of the big picture. Uh, if you are currently living vicariously through your kid in any way, shape, or form, you have lost sight of the big picture. Uh, if you are pressuring your kid to do stuff that you know they don't want to do, but that you want them to do, things that don't fit their gifts, talents, and passions, you may have lost sight of the big picture. Uh, if your goal is to make your kids as comfortable as possible, you've lost sight of the big picture. If you're constantly intervening in all of your kids' conflict, you've lost sight of your big picture. If you're constantly justifying all of your kids' mistakes, you've lost sight of the big picture. If you don't have your kid plugged into a healthy church, you've lost sight of the big picture. Or if you're not raising your kid to know that Jesus is their number one priority and there is no close second, then you lost sight of the big picture. See, here's where we go wrong as parents a lot. Um, we think our kids are like trophies or something. They're not trophies. I mean, we, so we like live vicariously through them and we want so bad for them to make their mark that sometimes we try to make their mark for them. That's the worst thing you could possibly do. And I get why, because our kids are a reflection on us and we want us to look good. But think about that. I want I, I want me to look good. That's not cross-shaped love. That's self-love, not selfless love. That's doing what's best for me, not what's best for them. And I know that's not how you want to parent. So let's pull back, let's pull back again. And, and let's, let's just review real quick. Here's what I found the very best parents focus on. These two questions. What's the loving thing to do? Like what's best for my kid, one. And then two, what's the wise way to land it with them? And if you wanna grow in love and wisdom, there are a few ideas for you. All right, um, let me close by saying this. I, I believe that parenting is one of the highest and holiest, call, uh, holiest callings there is. It's not the highest and the holiest. You don't have to be a parent to be a tremendous committed follower of Jesus, but it is a high and holy calling. And so I want you to know that if you're here today and you feel incapable uh, in some way of being a parent, you're probably right. You're probably right. We are in incapable. We are frail human beings raising frail human beings, right smack dab in the middle of our growth and sanctification. But here's the good news. Parenting is a high and holy calling. And so God promises to walk alongside you, mom. He, he promises to walk alongside you, dad. He promises that through your weaknesses, he'll be strong. He promises that you're not the only one walking down the hallways of your house. No, he's walking with you. The Holy Spirit resides inside of you and Jesus wants to rule your home if you'll give it to him. He promises that. It's a high and holy calling. Here's what else makes it so high and holy. Through parenting, we change the world. We change the world. The next generation will change the world. The only question is how. And we all know that moms and dads hold the formative clay of the hearts and the minds of the next generation in the palms of their hands. Jesus' second great command was to love your neighbor as yourself. And neighbor implies proximity. And I can think of few people in more closer proximity to you than your kids. So let's love them well. Because here's what I know. R revival does not start in a White House. Revival does not start in a Capitol building. It doesn't start in a Supreme Court. No, revival starts in homes. It starts around dinner tables. It starts at boy time and during family game nights and in little, little gatherings like this where villages come together and they say to one another, we'll be your village. Let's raise our kids to know the truth, even though the days are changing. 
So we do me a favor, parents, will you stand? And Northeast family, will you stand with all the parents in the room? Stand together. I want to pray over you. Um, but before I do, I just want to challenge you. Make this series a priority. None of us are perfect parents. We can all get better. Whether you're parenting and kids who are older or younger, this parenting is going to add value. We've got a couple of guest speakers who are going to come in and talk during this series that I think you're going to find are great. We're going to hit topics like marriage and parenting, mom guilt. That'll be a fun one. I'm not preaching that one. Uh, uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about discipline. Oh, and we're going to talk about raising your kids to know Jesus in a world that sometimes seems very, very far from Jesus. So... Um, uh, be here. Uh, let me pray for you right now. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, I just pray a, a prayer of blessing over all the teams raising up kids in this room night right now. The moms and the dads and the uncles and the aunts, the grandmas and the grandpas and the friends. And I just love seeing over here in front of the baptistry, this team, this team over here that showed up for, for one very special young girl. Cultivate inside of us uh, a cross-shaped love, kind of cross-shaped love where we can always see what's best for our kids. Cross-shaped love that's always willing to do whatever it takes for our kids. And also give us wisdom. You say if we ask for wisdom, you'll give it. So give us the wisdom that comes from God so that we'll know how to communicate it in a way that truly changes our kids forever. That's what we want. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Wow. It's like drinking from a fire hose on that one. Might have to go back and listen to that a couple times this week. Um, we are so glad that you joined us today. Hey, if you are a parent and you just need prayer, we always have the fireside room, no matter what's going on in your life. Uh, we'd love to meet you in there and pray with you. If you're a first-time guest, stop by our guest kiosk. We'd love to get to meet you. And if you are here for the best parents ever, make sure you get your name in the ballot in the middle of the lobby. Have a great week. We'll see you again next week.